Okay, let's let's get started. Uh, thank you everyone for uh, joining to this meeting. Uh, in case you need to drop out, uh, I will be recording this so you can also watch it later. Uh, feel free to unmute yourself if you have any questions. So this is uh, lecture 11 uh, for our EE 628 uh, deep learning course for spring semester at uh, Stevens Institute of Technology. Um, so a few announcements. Uh, the deadline for the project is uh, April 27th, Monday, 5 p.m. So this is to give myself some time to read your reports. And the project presentations uh, are on April 30th. And remember, 40% uh, of your grade uh, will be based on the, the project presentation. And you can read the details on grading for your projects uh, in our GitHub um, webpage. And uh, also I received your uh, project proposals. So thank you so much for that. They all look very interesting and I'm looking forward to hearing your projects. Okay, so if you overview, um, in the last lecture, we covered uh, GRUs and LSTMs, um, and the frameworks that are uh, designed to address uh, gradients, uh, uh, Grad, gradient uh, exploration or uh, vanishing. And also we discuss attention mechanisms and also uh, transformers. And today we will finally uh, cover natural language processing, um, both uh, pre-training and applications. And again, the source material for this uh, class is um, one uh, dive, dive into deep learning uh, book, textbook, and also I will be sharing the slides in our GitHub page. So to understand text, we can begin with its representation, right? So basically we can just treat each word as an individual text token. And today we will see that the representation of each token can be pre-trained on a large corpus using word to work or GLOW or subword embedding models. Uh, but after pre-training, representation of each token remains the same, no matter what the context is. So for example, the word bank is same in both go to bank to deposit money and go to bank to sit down. And of course, uh, the contexts here are different. So we shouldn't use the same representation for bank in these two different contexts. So that's why many more recent pre-training models adapt the representation of the same token to different contexts. So today we will focus on how to pre-train such representations for text. So uh, there are various ways to do this. So we are gonna discuss word to vec and Glow and little bit software embedding and finally BERT. And uh, for, we can actually pick the architecture uh, depending on the application we want. So let's start with uh, word to vec So natural language uh, is a complex system that we use to communicate, right? And uh, words are commonly used as the unit analysis in, uh, in natural language processing. That's why a, a word vector is a vector that's used to represent a word because we need numbers uh, to interact with uh, uh, with computers, but we use words to interact with each other. And the technique of mapping words to vectors of real numbers is also known as word embedding. So over the last few years, word embedding has gradually become basic knowledge in natural language processing. And we will discuss some of the uh, recent works on this. So you might be asking why not just to use uh, one half vectors? That's what we have been using in the in the past lectures. Um, well, uh, first of all, let's, re let's remember what one hot vector was. So each word is represented as a vector of length n, and here n is our dictionary size. And in one hot uh, word vector, we actually have only one uh, entry of this n-dimensional vector as one, and all the rest is zero, right? Um, so, they are obviously very easy to construct, but they are usually not a good choice. 
So the reason why they are not a good choice is because the one hot word vectors cannot accurately express the similarity between different words, right? So when you just, um, if you want to quantify how similar two words are, and if you use just one hot uh, encoding, then it will always be zero unless they are the identical words. So let's um, talk about cosine similarity, which is a, a metric to measure similarity between two vectors. So let's say we have vectors X and Y, which are both D-dimensional, and their cosine similarities are just the cosines of the angles between them. So you just take um, X transpose Y and you normalize by the norms of these vectors. And this is, of course, always between minus one and one. So, as I said, the cosine similarity between one hot vectors of any two different words is zero. So that's why it is difficult to use uh, the one hot vector to accurately represent the similarity between multiple dif different words. So, what are the options um, if we are not going to use one hot vector? So, one is the skip gram model. So the script gram model assumes that a word can be used to generate words that surround it in a text sequence. For example, assume that the text sequence is the man loves his son, and we use loves as the central target word and set the context, word, uh, context win window to size two. And the skip gram model is concerned with the conditional probability for generating these context words within a distance of no more than two words. So basically, given these loves, which is the central target word, we want to find out the probability of these context words that are uh, no more than two words in distance. And we also assume that these context words are conditionally independent from each other. So that's why instead of um, computing this probability, this joint probability of these four words, we can actually compute um, each, each word, each conditional probability for each word independent and just sum them up. So here we are using conditionally independence assumption. So basically just to represent if given the uh, central target vector or uh, central target word loves, what is the probability of having the man his son? So in the skip gram model, each word is represented as um, two D-dimension vectors. So given a word, we will have two vectors, okay? And uh, these vectors will be used to compute the conditional probability. So we assume that the word is indexed as I in the dictionary. Its vector is represented as VI when it is the central target word and ui when it is the context word okay so for each i we have vi and ui and uh, let's say the central target word is represented as wc and context word is represented as wo um, and the conditional probability of generating the context word wo for the given central target word, WC, can be obtained by performing this softmax operation on the vector inner product. So again, so UIs uh, represent the vector uh, when it is the context word, okay? And Vs are when they are the central, uh, central uh, target word. So given the central target word, what is the probability of seeing this context word WO? And we, we do this by using a uh, softmax operation on this um, UO, which is the uh, vector representation of the context word when it is actually the context word. And we just uh, normalize it uh, by all other context words, okay? And for each, we actually just look at the dot product with, uh, with the central target representation of the central target word. Okay, and let's assume that a text sequence of length um, t is given. So, and the word at time t is denoted as wt. 
And let's also assume that context words are independently generated given the center words. And when context size is M, remember, we are only looking for uh, M distance from the central target word. Then the likelihood function of the skip gram model is just the joint probability of generating all the context words given any center, uh, center word. So here, for any given center word, for each T, we look at its uh, um, neighbor, neighboring words and we call them context words. And we do this for all Ts, okay? So this is the joint probability of generating all the context words given any center word. And um, so in skip gram model, the parameters that we want to learn are the central target word vector and context word vector for each individual word. And in the training process, we are going to learn the model parameters by maximizing the likelihood function. And this is equivalent to minimizing the um, negative log likelihood function, right? So I'm just writing the same probability and take the logarithm and just take the minus because we like minimizing functions instead of maximizing. Um, and uh, so by definition, the, the logarithm of uh, probability of given a context word, given the central word, we can actually write this, right? Because this comes from um, our, our softmax uh, representation. So if you take logarithm of this, you will have u, u0, sorry, u all transpose vc divided by log of this summation, right? So we, we can write this representation in, instead of this probability. And after the training for any word in dictionary with index i, let's say, we are going to get its two words, um, two, two word vector sets as vi and ui. And uh, in applications of natural language processing or NLP, the central target word vector in the skip gram model is generally used as the representation uh, vector of word, okay? So yes, you, you learn both of these VIs and UIs, but at the end, what you are uh, using is actually the central target vector representation. And uh, another model um, is uh, the continuous bag of words, SIBO model. And uh, this model is actually similar to the skip gram, but the biggest difference is that um, continuous bag of word, words uh, model assumes that the central target word is generated based on the context words before and after it in the text sequence. So let's say we have the same text, uh, text sequence the man loves his son, in which loves is the central target word. So given a context window of size two, CW or, uh, CBW, CBOW model is concerned with the conditional probability of generating the target vector loves based on the context words, um, the man, his and sons like this. So instead of having the man, his son given the loves, given loves, we, we are actually interested in uh, what is the probability of loss given all these context words. And, um, but in this case, there are multiple context words in CBOW model. So we will average their word vectors and then use the same method as the skip gram model to compute the conditional probability, okay? So let's assume that VI and UI are the context word and the central target word representation for the word with index I in our dictionary. And let's central target vector WC indexed as C and context um, words so are defined as WO1 all the way to WO2M. And uh, here the indices are O1 to O2M that are in the dictionary. And remember, M here is actually the window size. And then the conditional probability of generating a central target word for, uh, from the given context word can be defined as this. So given the context words in my window, what is the probability of generating the central uh, target word? And here we actually use 
uh, similar idea is skip gram model where we have this softmax function, but instead of using a single V here, we are actually using the um, average of all these V representations. And remember, V is the context word representation. And um, we, of course, normalize it for each I in the denominator. And uh, just for simplicity, let's represent all these summations uh, divided by 2M by V O uh, hat, sorry, bar, bar of V O, and also the set that contains all these vector is defined as uh, v, uh, W0, then the conditional probability of uh, central word given the context W0 set, which is all, all the words here, can be represented as this uh, softmax function where we just replaced all this uh, average of uh, context vector representation by their average. Okay. And uh, given a text sequence of length t, we assume that the word at time step t is again represented as wt and the context, uh, context window size is defined as m. Then the likelihood function of the CBOW model is the probability of generating any central word from the context words. So for each wt, I look at its uh, neighbors. Okay, and um, then the maximum likelihood estimation of the CBOW model is equivalent to minimizing the loss function. So instead of maximizing this, I'm minimizing negative of log of this. And again, I can uh, write uh, this expression instead of this probability here. And then I just need to do um, gradient descent based on this, where my, my parameters are uh, U's and V's, okay? Um, so we can copy the gradient um, uh, with respect to this, and then we use the same method to obtain the gradients for uh, other word vectors too, but unlike the skip gram model, we usually use the context word vector as the representation vector for a word in CW model. Okay, it's CBOW model. And um, well, um, we, need, we may need to do some approximate training for uh, word to vec because um, the core feature of the skip gram model and also for the CBOW model, but let's focus on skip gram model here. We use the softmax operations to compute the conditional probability of generating context word W O based on the given central uh, target word W C, right? So this is our probability of generating um, central target word given the context word, and the logarithmic loss function. Uh, loss. Um, it, it looks like my internet connection is unstable. I hope you guys are hearing me well, um, and I hope recording is going well too. Um, Okay, so the logarithmic loss corresponding to this uh, condition probability is uh, given as this, right? And um, this loss includes some of the number of items in the dictionary size, right? And uh, so when you do the gradient computation for each step, uh, that contains the sum of the number of items in the dictionary size. So obviously, if uh, your dictionary size is, uh, is, is too large, like with hundreds of thousands or even millions of words, then the overhead for computing each gradient may be too high. So in order to reduce such computation complexity, we actually introduce uh, two approximate training methods um, in uh, today's class. One is negative sampling, and the other one is hierarchical softmax. So let's start with uh, negative, uh, uh, negative sampling. Uh, so basically negative sampling uh, modifies the original objective function. So given a context window for the central target word WC, we will treat it as an event for context word WO to appear in the context window. 
and compute the probability of this event from this probability. So probability of event uh, equals to one is actually, um, th that means when this context word and the target word appear together and we represent it by a sigmoid function. And we will first consider training the word vector by maximizing the joint probability of all events in the text sequence. And we consider maximizing the probability of these two um, uh, events, uh, actually this event to occur in a given window for each, uh, for each word, okay? So basically we are asking if a context word W0 appears in the context window, then uh, the probability of that event occurring or D being equal to one um, is high if, if it occurs. But um, these events um, that we include in this uh, joint probability only consider positive examples and um, negative sampli sampling uh, makes this objective function more meaning meaningful by sampling with an addition of negative examples too. Okay, so yes, you are only considering when the, each uh, central word appear in the windows, uh, window with the context word, but what, what about the cases that they don't appear together? So you should also consider when D is equal to zero. So for this, uh, in negative sampling, we actually sample K words that do not appear in the context window uh, to kind of act as, a, as noise words. So by considering negative sampling, we can write, rewrite the joint probability above, which only considers positive examples as this. So basically for each, um, each word T, we look at the probability of that uh, context word appearing around the central word. Um, and then we just do it for each word in that window. And now the condition probability is approximated to be uh, so this conditional probability can be the event being equal to one times when event is equal to zero and this um, context uh, word doesn't occur together with this WK, which is the, sorry, uh, central target word WT doesn't occur together with WK. Okay, and here we just sample K words that do not appear in the context window. Okay, and then the logarithmic loss for the conditional probability, for, for this conditional probability can be written as um, minus log of this probability, minus um, this um, product becomes summation, of course, of this log of P when the event doesn't occur, okay? So now the gradient computation in each step of the training is no longer related to the dictionary size, but it is actually related to this K, which is usually much smaller than the dictionary size, okay? And the other approach is hierarchical softmax. Uh, so this is just another type uh, of approximate training method. And it actually uses uh, a binary tree for data structure where the leaf nodes of the tree represent every word in the dictionary. So these are the leaf, leaf nodes. So these actually represent um, each word. Okay, not these ones, but only the leaf nodes. And we assume LW is the number of nodes on the path from the root um, of the binary theory to the, to the leaf node of words. For example, if you are interested in the word W3, then how many, num how, many, how many nodes do we have here from the root? So we have one, two, three, and four. So LW for this word is four. And let uh, N of W and J be the J node on this path with the context vec uh, word vector U, okay? So context word, um, so for example, for this node and W32, we represent um, the, uh, we, we use the context re uh, word vector that is uh, defined as U for this node, okay? 
And then hierarchical softmax will approximate the conditional probability in the skip ground model, for example, what is the probability of um, seeing a context word given the uh, central word. Here they actually have uh, this term. So basically if that node um, being equal to, if, if, the, if this node is equal to the left child of that node, and then it is one. Otherwise, it is minus one. Okay, so what do I mean here? So let's look at uh, W3, probability of W3, okay, given the context word. So I first look for um, W and W31. So what is the N of W31? So it is this node, right? And so N of W32, is it, uh, sorry, I need to accept someone. Uh, okay, sorry for that. Where was I? Okay, so um, we were looking at um, so for this one, for the, uh, when WO is W3, so we will use N of 3, J starts from 1, so N of 3, um, sorry here, uh, yeah, if N of 3 of 2 is equal to left child of N of uh, three of one, then this is equal to one. So is, is, uh, and so is, is actually this node on the left, left child of this node, then it is one. So I multiply it by one, and then I use the representation of that node with the central, uh, central target vector. And then next I check if the next node is left child of this one, it is no, so it has to be multiplied by minus one. So that's why I have minus here. And then I use the, uh, that product between uh, the representation of that node with my central uh, target word, uh, words representation. And then finally, I check um, if W3 is on the left of this node, it is yes, so it will be multiplied by one, okay? And then this conditional probability is defined as um, a multiplication of all these three uh, sigmoid functions. And uh, another word embedding um, approach is GLOVE. It comes from global vectors. But first we should review the skip gram model in word to work. So the condition probability of Wj given Wi expressed in the skip gram model using the softmax operation can be recorded as uh, Qij, okay? So this is, the, uh, this is how we represent the condition probability in the skip gram model. And here Vs and Us are the vector representation of word Wi uh, of index i, okay? And V is the center central word representation and U is the context word representation. And um, for word WI, it may appear in the data set for multiple times, right? So we collect all the context words every time when WI is a center word and keep the duplicates. And in, uh, we denote them as a multiset CI. And the number of an element in a multiset is called the multiplicity of the element. Okay, what do I mean by this? So let's say the uh, word WI appears twice in the data set, okay? So I find where it appears in my data set and then I look for the window in that data set, okay? Um, and the context windows when these two WI become the center words in the text sequence can contain word indices 2152 and the other one can have the word indices two, three, two, one. So here, each, each of these arrays actually represents the uh, word indices 
for each window where this um, uh, WI word occurs. And then we define this multiset CI, which has 1, 1, 2, 2, 2, sorry, 2, 2, 2, 2, and 3 and 5. So here it means that we saw one twice, so we will have one, one, and there are um, how many? Four of two, so we will have two, 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 and there's only a single three, three, and there's single five, five. So here the multiplicity of element one is two, and the multiplicity of element two is four, and the multi multiplicities of elements three and five are both one. And here we denote the multiplicity of element j in multiset ci as xi, uh, sorry, xj, okay? So for example, um, here let's say j is um, 2. In this case, xij is going to be 4 because the multiplicity of 2 here is 4. So it is the number of word wj in all context windows for center word wi in the entire data set, okay? And as a result, the loss function of the skip gram model can be expressed in a different way. So we will have this xij, the multiplicity of each, um, each word wj in context, uh, context windows for center word wi, and then we have this, we multiply it by this conditional probability, okay? And um, we add up the number of all context words for the central target word WI to get XI, right? So uh, XI is actually the number of the uh, occurrence of these, uh, of these XIs. Oh, sorry, sorry. It is the number of all context words for the central word WI. Okay, so how many context words do, do we have for this WI? Um, and then the conditional probability um, can be written as XIJ given XI. And uh, let's represent this by uh, PIJ. Then we can rewrite this loss function of the skip gram model as, as this summation. So basically it's just the same representation, but instead of using XIJ, I just um, write it as xi times pij, okay? And in this formula, um, so this is actually the cross entropy between the conditional probability distribution, pij, for context word generation based on the central target word, wi, and the cross entropy of conditional probability distribution, qij, predicted by model, okay? So, the loss function is weighted um, using the sum of number of context words with the central target word wi. So basically, we, we multiply this with xi, um, which is the sum of the number of context words uh, with the central target word wi. Uh, but here, the cross entropy loss function may not be a good choice because um, First, uh, the cost of letting the model prediction QIJ has the sum of all items in the entire dictionary in its denominator. So this can easily lead to excessive computational overhead. And second, there are a lot of uncommon words in the dictionary and they appear rarely in the data set. And in the cross entropy loss function, the final prediction of the conditional probability distribution on a large number of uncommon words is uh, likely to be inaccurate. So to address this, GLOW, a word embedding model that came uh, after word to vec uh, adopts square loss and makes three major changes to the skip gram model based on this loss. So here we use the non-probability distribution variables. Uh, um, so instead of using PIJ, we represent it as PIJ uh, hats. Uh, by number of xij, so this is the multiplicity of each j given word i, and also instead of using this conditional uh, probability that is normalized by the sum of these exponentials, we actually have this um, exponential uj transpose vi. And then we take their logs, so we get the square loss uh, as this. 
So instead of using the cross entropy between PIJ and QIJ, we actually compute this uh, square loss between UJ transpose VI and log of XIJ. And we also add two scalar model parameters for each word WI, which is the bias term VI for central target words, and also CI for the context words. And we replace the weight of each loss with the function uh, H of XIJ. And here the weight function H of X is a monotone increasing function with the range uh, zero to one. So at the end, the goal of uh, GLOW is to minimize this loss function. So we have this weight and we also have this mean square error, um, uh, mean square error loss. Um, okay, so we have a suggestion for the choice of the weight uh, function h of x. Uh, this is defined as this. Um, so when h of zero is uh, when when this is when x is zero, then it is zero. So the loss term for x i j is equal to zero, which can simply be ignored. Um, and the non-zero xij are computed in advance based on the entire data set and they contain the global statistics for the data set. So remember uh, the xij was, the, was defined as the, um, as the number of words wj in all context windows for center word wi. Okay, so for example, it, it was actually the multiplicity of each uh, vector here. Um, so we can compute it in advance uh, based on the entire data set. That's why they contain global statistics for the data set. That's why the uh, name GLOW is taken from global vectors. And also if word WI appears in the context window of uh, word wj, then wj will also appear in the context window of wi. That's why xij uh, is equal to xji. Uh, and unlike word to vec, GLOW fits the symmetric log xij, while the conditional probabilities pij are asymmetric. That's why the central target word vector and context word vector of any word are equivalent in GLOW. Um, but uh, these two sets of word vectors that are learned by the same word may be a uh, little bit different because of the different initialization values. And uh, after learning all the word vectors, GLOW will use the sum of the central target word vector and the context word vector is the final word vector for the word. So for each word, we will use the sum of central target word vector and the context word vector. Okay. Um, so let's um, understand uh, GLOW from the conditional probability ratios. So from a real example, from a large a corpus, here we have the uh, following two sets of conditional probabilities with ice and steam is the central target words and the ratio between them. So, um, probability, so, so when the word solid is um, actually, yes, yeah, so when the word solid is the uh, central target word given i's, then uh, it is actually not as high, the probability is not as high as when water is the central target word given i's, which makes sense, right? And here, given steam, it looks like having water has actually a higher probability. And then, um, by uh, looking uh, at the ratio of these conditional probabilities, we can represent the relationship between uh, different words more intuitively. So we can actually, um, you can see that if this P1 and P2 is uh, really large, in which case um, probability of solid given I's is um, different, so solid is actually related to ice more than solid is related to steam. That's why P1 over P2 is very large here. But here, for example, um, probability of water given ice and probability of water given steam might be actually similar. That's why the ratio is close to one. 
and also probability of fashion given eyes and probability of fashion given steam are um, equivalent to unrelevant. That's why the ratio of probabilities is, is close to one. Okay. Um, I guess I can skip these parts. Um, so this is actually to show why the loss function as a mean square error makes sense for GLOW. And okay, so now let's move to a different uh, concept, which is subword embedding. So words usually have internal structures and uh, formation methods, right? So for example, we can deduce the relationship between dog, dogs, uh, and dog catcher by their spelling. And this association can be extended to other words too. For example, the relationship between dog and dogs is just like the relationship between cat and cat. Uh, in fact, morphology uh, studies the internal structure and formation of these words. And uh, in word to vec we didn't directly use morphology information. For example, uh, dog and dogs are represented by two different vectors. And in view of this, fast text, um, which is um, uh, proposed by Bojanowski in 2017, proposed the method of uh, subword embedding. So you can actually read this uh, paper if you are interested in. And uh, in uh, fast text, each central word is represented as a collection of subwords. Uh, and uh, for example, let's consider the word where as an example to understand how subwords are formed. So we first add these special characters at the beginning and the end of the word to distinguish the subwords used as prefixes and suffixes. Then we treat the word as a sequence of characters to extract n-gram. So for example, if n is equal to three, we can get all subwords with a length of three like this. And, uh, uh, and also we will have the special subword uh, where, again, with, the, uh, with these special characters. And in fast text, a word W, uh, for, for a word W, we record the union of all its subwords uh, with length of three to six. Uh, and also with their special subwords as GW. And, so this way the dictionary is actually the union of the collection of these subwords of all words, right? So assume the vector of the subword G in the dictionary is ZG, then the central word, uh, central uh, word vector UW for the word W in the skip gram model can be expressed as this. So basically um, for central word uh, W, we use all these ZGs um, where each ZG is actually the vector of the subword uh, of G in the dictionary, okay? And the rest of the uh, fast text is consistent with the skip gram model, so you apply the same things. Um, but here, um, if the, diction the dictionary in fast text is larger, so it results in more parameters. And also uh, the vector of one word requires summation of all subword vectors, which of course results in higher computation complexity. Okay, so, um, so far we actually discussed um, skip gram, CBOW is like word to vec uh, models um, and also GLOW. And um, also we discussed about uh, subtext uh, representation, uh, fast test, the fast text. And now let's move to a different uh, embedding model, uh, which is called BERT, bidirectional encoder representations from transformers. Um, so the BERT embedding models uh, that we discussed so far are all context independent. Uh, and of course, uh, they have some obvious limitations. For example, the word crane in context, a crane is flying and the crane driver came has completely different meanings. Uh, so the same word may be assigned um, different representations depending on context, right? 
So you cannot use the same representation um, for the same word when it is in different contexts. So this motivates the development of context sensitive word representations where representations of words depend on their context. So here, instead of, um, so let, let's assume we represent token uh, X for each word. What we have been doing so far was actually uh, learning a function F of X, right? So F is actually the embedding model. But here in context sensitive representations, we also have this C of X, which actually represents the context of the token X. And uh, popular uh, context sensitive representations include uh, language model augmented sequence tagger or context vectors or embeddings from language models. Uh, for example, ALMO combines all the intermediate layer representations from pre-trained bidirectional LSTM as the output representation. And um, then the ALMO representation will be added to a downstream task um, existing in supervised model as additional features. So basically it can concatenate ALMO representation with the original representation. Um, but um, this solution uh, still hinges on a task specific architecture and it is practically non-trivial to craft a specific architecture for every natural language processing task. So the GBT, on the other hand, generator pre-training model represents an effort in designing a general task agnostic model for context sensitive representations. So it is built on a transformer decoder and then GPT pre-trains a language model that will be used to represent text sequences. Uh, in contrast to ALMO, um, it, uh, which freezes parameters of the pre-trained model, GPT fine tunes all the par uh, parameters in the pre-trained transformer decoder during supervised learning um, in the downstream, downstream task. Um, but um, one um, disadvantage of GPT is that it uh, uses autoregressive nature uh, of language models. So uh, it can uh, only look forward. So for example, GPT will return the same representation for bank in both of these contexts. I went to the bank to deposit cash and I went to the bank to sit down because it only looks forward so it, on, it can only uh, generate context based on what it has seen before this word bank, which is I went to, and it is the same thing, um, same sequence in this uh, sentence too. So it will return the same representation, which is obviously uh, not ideal. And um, so, ALMO encodes context bidirectionally, but uses task-specific architectures, but GPT is task agnostic, but encodes context left to right. So can we combine um, both of these, uh, these approaches? Uh, the answer is yes. So BERT encodes context uh, bidirectionally and requires minimal architecture changes for a wide range of uh, NLP tasks. You can actually read the paper where BERT was proposed. It's actually really well written. Um, so this, is, uh, this figure compares uh, these three approaches. So in ALMO, uh, we have the pre-training and it also uses uh, bi-directional architecture, but uh, for each uh, NLP task, it needs to architecture uh, the network. GPT, on the other hand, uses uh, unidirectional architecture, but it uh, requires minimal changes in the architecture for each task. And BERT uses both bidirectional architecture, but it requires minimal changes in the architecture for each NLP task. So let's talk about input representation in BERT. Um, so one word input sequence may include either one text sequence or two text sequences. Uh, so we will use one text sequences in uh, tasks such as sentimental analysis, or <coughs> we can use pair of text sequences 
uh, for tasks like nature language uh, preference, uh, sort of na nature language inference. And um, to distinguish uh, text payers, the learner segment embeddings uh, EA and EB are added to the to token embeddings. Um, for single inputs, of course, we will only have EA, okay? So if you have um, a pair of sequences uh, as an input to the bird, then you will have um, segment embeddings uh, for each sequence, one for EA and one for EB, but if your input is um, a text, uh, is a single text input, then of course you are just going to use EA. Um, and um, BERT chooses the transformer encoder as its bidirectional architecture. Um, if you remember from last week, transformers actually um, use this uh, positional information and also, uh, so they use positional in information to replace the, uh, the LSTMs. Um, but uh, BERT uses learn learnable positional embeddings, unlike the original transformer uh, encoder. So this is an illustration of input representation for, uh, for BERT. Let's say we have um, a pair of texts. So let's say we have, this movie is great, I like it. And of course, we need to use some special characters to separate them and also to start the input. So we will have token embeddings for each token here first. And then you will also have segment embeddings. So we will have EA for the first, uh, first sentence and EB for the second sentence. And we will also have positional embeddings uh, for each token here like E0, E1, E2. And the embeddings of the uh, word input sequence is just the sum of the uh, token embeddings. So we, just, we will just sum these token embeddings, segment embeddings, and also positional embeddings. And um, the forward propagation of BERT encoder gives the BERT representation of each token in the input text and the inserted special tokens. Uh, and next, we will use these representations to compute the loss functions for pre-training BERT. Um, so the pre-training is composed of the uh, two following tasks. So one is masked language modeling, and second is uh, next sentence prediction. So to encode co context bidirectionally for representing each token, BERT randomly masks tokens and uses tokens from bidirection context to predict masked tokens. So in this pre-training task, 15% uh, of tokens will be selected at random as the masked tokens for prediction. Uh, so let's say, assume, uh, so let's assume great, the, the word great is selected to be masked and predicted in this movie is great, then the input will be replaced with, um, so for example, uh, we will use a mask 80% of the time. So this movie is great becomes this movie is masked. So we use this special mask character or uh, we will replace uh, great with some random token 10% of the time. So this movie is great becomes this movie is drink. And um, sometimes, I mean, 10% of the time, actually we just don't change anything. So this movie is great becomes this movie is great. And um, so although masked language modeling is able to encode bidirection context for representing words, it doesn't explicitly model the logical relationship between text pairs. So to help understand the relationship between two text, uh, text sequences, BERT considers a binary classification task, uh, which is next sentence prediction in its pre-training. So when generating sentence uh, pairs for pre-training, for half of the time, they are indeed consecutive sequence, uh, sentences with the label true, while for the other half of the time, the second sentence is randomly sampled from the corpus with the label false. 
Um, so this is actually a final code in Gulion uh, for birth model. So when a pre-training birth, the final loss function is a linear combination of both the loss functions for mass language modeling and next sentence prediction. So for example, here um, we will have, we will define birth encoder as an encoder. Uh, and then we will also define uh, this uh, mask, uh, uh, mask part and also next sentence prediction. And uh, in the forward, we first uh, pass our tokens to encoder. And then we predict the uh, next, uh, we predict the masked uh, words using this MLM function. And then next, um, we will also use, uh, we will also predict the next sentence by encode, by using this encoded X in NSP as well. And then we return the encoded X and also the mass and uh, prediction for, for the next as well. But the final loss is the linear combination of uh, the, um, of the, uh, of both the loss functions for mask language modeling which, is, which comes from here, and also next sentence prediction. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the applications for NLP. So we have seen how to train, uh, sorry, how to represent tokens and train their representations. Um, and um, such trained text representation can be fed to various models for different downstream uh, natural language processing tasks, right? So we have already discussed several NLP applications without any pre-training in earlier classes to discuss RNN. So we just used the uh, one hot encoding as, uh, as embedding, and then we built our uh, application. But given pre-trained text uh, representation, we can consider um, two more downstream NLP tasks. One is sentiment analysis, um, which analyzes single text, and the other one is nature language inference, which analyzes relationship of text pairs. And of course, these are not the only applications, uh, um, but uh, just for today's class, we will only focus on these two applications, okay? And using um, uh, pre-trained embeddings will actually improve uh, the performance of these applications. So, to summarize, for pre-training, what can we use? We can use word to vec we can use GLOVE, we can use subword embedding, or we can use BERT, and we can use Entifle and Architecture, NLP, CNN, RNN, or Attention for these two applications that we will be uh, focusing on today's class. So one is sentiment analysis, which requires a single text, and the other one is nature language inference, that, which requires text pairs. And the sentiment analysis or uh, text classification is a common task in natural language processing, uh, which transforms a sequence of text of infinite length into a category of text. So by using text sentiment classification, we can actually analyze the emotions of the text author, for example. Um, and um, of course, it has a wide range of applications. For example, we can analyze user reviews of products to obtain user satisfaction statistics or analyze user sentiments about market conditions and use it to predict future trends. And um, so we actually can use the uh, data from Stanford's large movie review data sets um, for our purposes. So this data set is divided into two sets of, two sets for training and testing purposes. So if you are doing any project um, in, uh, related to NLP, you can actually use this data too. And in each data set, the number of comments uh, labeled as positive or, uh, so, sorry, so for each data set, um, we have labels either positive and negative, so positive meaning that uh, um, review is positive and negative, of course, uh, meaning that the review is negative and the number of these commands are actually equal in this data set. So you can easily download this um, data set using uh, Gullion, Gullion's functions. 
And then, for example, just to see how the data looks like, uh, for example, if the review is like normally the best way to something, something uh, is labeled as one, which means it was a positive review, or the Bible teaches us that blah, 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 then it looks like a positive review too. Okay, so this is how the data looks like. And also for each review, we can actually look at the um, histogram of the length of the review. So it looks like uh, each review is about 150 words in general. And um, because the reviews have different lengths, uh, they cannot be directly combined into many batches. So here we fix the length of each comment to 500. Uh, so if the uh, length is more than 500, we just truncate. If it is less, we just add uh, this uh, special character. Unk, okay. And we can easily create a data iterator that returns both the uh, both the reviews and also their labels. And this is uh, how the function load data IMDB looks like. So it just it returns you um, iterator for the train and iterator for the test and also the vocabulary. And now let's um, talk about text sentiment classification using recurrent neural networks. So let's uh, let's use GLOW as pre-training model, as embedding model, um, and architecture is RNN, and we, our application is sentiment analysis. And um, yeah, so text classification is also a downstream application of word embedding. Uh, we will apply pre-trained word vectors, GLOW, and bidirectional recurrent neural networks with multiple hidden layers. And we will use them to determine whether a text sequence of infinite length contains positive or negative emotion. So it's not infinite length, it's I'm an indefinite length. And uh, so each word first obtains a feature vector from the embedding layer. Then we further encode, so maybe you, we, you can look at here, uh, so we will have the embedding and encode, uh, encoder and decoder layers. So each word first obtains a feature vector from this embedding layer. Then we further encode the feature sequence using uh, bidirectional recurrent neural network to obtain the sequence information. And finally, in decoder, we transform the encoded sequence information to output through some fully connected layer. So in the, in the for, so this actually, this, this is a forward function of this uh, by RNN. Um, we can actually, for the output, sorry, for the, for the input to decoder, we can actually concatenate um, the hidden states of bidirectional long short term memory in the initial time step, which is output zero and final time step, um, which is outputs minus one and pass it to the output, output layer for classification. And uh, we can directly use word vectors uh, pre-trained on a larger corpus as the feature vectors of all words. So here we can simply load 100 dimension global word vector for each word in the dictionary uh, vocabulary. So basically, we can um, we can use this uh, text embedding um, feature of Gluon, and then uh, we can get the uh, outputs of the word vectors in that vocabulary based on this uh, GLOW uh, embedding. So you see that since I'm using 100 dimensional GLOW uh, word vector representation, the output is training size by uh, 100, so 100 is the representation. So in my um, BRNN network here, I can just um, um, set the weights with these um, embeddings that I learned, uh, that I pre-trained using a larger corpus. 
and then I can do my training. Okay, so here I use the pre-trained glow in my embedding and uh, finally I can start training for this entire, um, entire bidirectional bi RNN model. Okay, and in prediction, for example, um, when I say uh, predict sentiment, I can just input the sentence I want and it can return me if it is positive or negative. Okay. And uh, what about uh, convolutional neural networks? So instead of using RNNs, can we actually use uh, CNNs? Um, so we explored how to process two-dimensional image data with two-dimensional convolutional neural networks. So in the previous language um, models and text classification tasks, we treated text data as a time series with only one dimension. And of course, naturally, we use the RNNs to process this sequential data. But in fact, we can also treat text as a one-dimensional image so that we can use one dimensional convolutional neural networks to capture associations between adjacent words. So here we describe a groundbreaking approach um, to applying CNNs to text analysis, which is uh, called to text CNN and proposed by Kim et al. in 2014. So now we will focus, we will consider um, the case where pre-training is performed by GLOW and architecture is uh, CNN and the application is still sentiment analysis. So like a two-dimensional um, convolutional layer, a one-dimension convolutional layer uses a one-dimensional cross-correlation operation. So in the one-dimensional cross-correlation operation, the convolution window starts from the leftmost side of the input array and slides on the input array from left to right successively. So for example, if this is my input and if this is my kernel, I multiply first two items with my kernel um, element-wise and sum up the results, which is two. And then I do that for one, two, uh, multiply with one, two, the output is five and so on. So the one dimension cross correlation operation for multiple input channels is also similar to the two dimensional cross correlation operation for multiple input channels, right? So on each channel, it performs the one dimensional cross correlation operation on the kernel and its corresponding input and adds the results of the channel. So let's say we have three channels in the input, each of them is a sequence and we have three different kernels and then uh, for each one, we actually multiply input with kernel for each channel and then sum up the results in the output. So the definition of a two-dimensional cross-correlation operation tells us that a one-dimensional cross-correlation operation with multiple channels can be regarded as a two-dimensional cross-correlation operation with a single input channel. So instead of having these multiple channels here, I can just assume there is only one channel, but it is multidimensional. My input is, uh, so my input is two dimensional and my kernel can also uh, have similar size. And then here is the output. And similarly, we have a one dimensional pooling layer. So the max over time pooling layer used in text CNN actually corresponds to a one dimensional global maximum pooling layer. So assuming that the input contains multiple channels and each channel consists of values on different time steps, the output of each channel will be the largest value of all time steps in the channel. So um, basically, maybe I can just show it in this figure. For example, if I have um, a uh, word sequence like a model loading and inference API is now available for Scala, so here each word is represented uh, by, by how many dimensions? By six dimensions, okay? And, um, and then I can represent this as like six, um, six by, um, how many words do I have here? 
four, eight, eleven. So six by eleven image, and I can actually use different uh, kernels. So I can use one kernel with two, one kernel with four. So here, let's say the output channels are four. So I'm going to have four channels instead of, instead of um, um, instead of uh, six channels, so from six to four. And then um, for each sequence, I actually, so I take each, each sequence and then apply the kernel. So that's why instead of having um, 11 dimension, the width of each output channel will become 11 minus two plus one because of the kernel width, you will have 10. So number of channels by 10 here. And if you use a different kernel, uh, kernel width, you, of course, you will get a similar, uh, different dimension. And then we will, have, we will run max pooling over time for each channel. So I'll take each channel here and compute the maximum value. And I'll do it for each channel here. That's why I'll get four, uh, four values here. And here, uh, for, the, for the other kernels, since there are five channels, then I will, I will do the max pooling over time for each channel. So I will output uh, five values here. And then I can, just pass, I can just concatenate them and pass them uh, to some fully connected layer. So this is the idea of text CNN. So basically, we just treat um, a text sequence like a uh, like an image and apply convolutional neural networks on convolutional operations on this. And other application is the natural language inference. Um, so natural language in, um, determines the logical the natural language inference determines the logical relationship between a pair of text sequences, and such uh, relationships uh, usually fall into three types. One is entail entailment, um, when the hypothesis can be inferred from the prim premise, and other one is contradiction, when negati negation of the hy hypothesis can be inferred from the premise, and neutral, all other cases, when nothing can be inferred. So for example, um, when if the premise is two women are hugging each other, and the hypothesis is two women are showing affection, this is an example for entailment. So the hypothesis can be inferred from the premise. And um, a man is running the code example from dive into deep learning, and the man is sleeping. So obviously, if you are running code from this book, you may not be sleeping. So this is an example for contradiction. And this is another example where premises, the music musicians are perform performing for us and hypothesis is the musicians are famous and this is an example to neutral because you cannot infer anything um, based on the premise. So uh, Parikh et al. in 2016 proposed decomposable attention model without recurrent and convolutional layers. Uh, so here we are going to consider uh, GLOW as pre-training and architecture is MLP and attention, and our application is natural language inference. So instead of preserving the order of words in premises and hypothesis, we can just align words in one text sequence to every word in the other, and vice versa, and then compare and aggregate such information. And the alignment of words can be neatly accomplished by attention mechanisms. So for example, Let's say my pr premise is I do need sleep and my hypothesis is I'm tired. So we want to um, infer relationship between this premise and hypothesis. So there are actually three major components um, of this approach. First is align. Uh, so for example, I can align the words I do need sleep and also uh, so I do need sleep from premise and I'm tired from hypothesis and then kind of come up with some uh, relationship between each pair of words. So here, let's assume I is mostly related with I. So that's why let's say it is one 
So this, this is an example for hard coding. Of course, it's not going to be perfectly one, it's going to be uh, some probability, but just for these visualization purposes, let's say I is mostly related to I and nothing else, and sleep is related to tired and nothing else. Um, and um, for the uh, premise given the hypothesis, I have, I am tired, I do need sleep, and I have I connected to I and tired connected to sleep here. And then from here, I can compare the word aligned words. So I is mostly related to I, do is related to nothing, need is related to nothing, and sleep uh, and tired are related. And for this side, I is related to I, M is related to nothing, tired is related to need and sleep. Okay, so because these two are uh, one here. And then uh, I aggregate these results from both sides and then sum and then concatenate. So that's what I will be doing in the aggregate part. So um, let's see how we are doing with time. So uh, for the attending part where we actually um, do the alignment, align, alignment of the word pairs. Uh, let's assume AI is a D dimensional embedding for word I in premise, and BI is D dimensional embedding for word I in hypothesis. And um, let's say we are doing soft alignments. So we compute attention weights as F of AI transpose F of BJ. And here F can be just a uh, multi layer perceptron. And now we compute the weighted average of all word embeddings. So we compute uh, beta i for, um, for the word in premise as a weighted sum of all the uh, words in, uh, in hypothesis. And I do the same thing for the words in, uh, in uh, hypothesis as a weighted sum of uh, all the words in the premise. So I obtain this beta i and alpha j vectors. And next we compare a word to, so th that was for attending and for the comparing part, we compare a word in one sequence with the other sequence that's softly aligned with that word. So in the comparing step, we feed the concatenation of words from one sequence and aligned words from other sequence into function g. So for example, here, uh, VAI uh, is the comparison between word I in the premise and all the hypothesis words that are softly aligned with word I. And similar for uh, VBJ. And in the last step, which is the aggregation, we just aggregate comparison vectors to infer logical relationship. So we begin by summing both sets like this, and now we fit the concatenation of these VAs and we VB of both summar summarization results into function H to obtain the classification result of the logical relationship. And um, now let's also consider application. So we just finished um, GLOW, MLP, attention, and natural language inference. So now let's uh, discuss if we can use BERT as pre training and just skip the attention in architecture because BERT already has attention uh, in pre-training. Uh, it's actually pretty simple with uh, uh, doing fine tuning with BERT is pretty simple because it only uh, requires an extra MLP layer. So you just define your BERT uh, as a pre-training and all you need to do is you just define your classifier. And next time when you have the then when you define the tokens, when you're uh, given the input, then you can just uh, compute the encode, encoding vectors based on uh, BERT architecture, and then uh, you can just output the classifier. Okay. Um, okay, so that was it for today. I know it was a um, little uh, fast uh, and also maybe uh, very high level, but I just want you to uh, to familiarize yourself with all these uh, most recent architectures and um, maybe even 
uh, even the terminology in NLP in case you want to dive into these NLP related applications, uh, either in your project research or in your uh, future career. Um, so if you want to understand the details of each concept that we discussed here, I suggest you to uh, read the papers that I cited in these slides uh, and let me know if you want to discuss. Um, do you have any questions so far? Maybe I should say stop here. Any questions? Um, okay, so next week we will continue with um, computer vision um, applications, more advanced computer vision applications. Okay, so thank you so much. See you next week.